Renal tumors are going to be something that you guys might come across incidentally. So that's how they're often discovered. If a patient um, is in a car accident or has a trauma, or if they have a CAT scan for another reason, then they might be incidentally found on CAT scan because of those things. So usually patients don't have symptoms, but if they do, then they are presenting with gross hematuria. Um, sometimes they might have some flank pain, some weight loss, um, decrease in appetite and fatigue. Um, so renal tumors can be benign or they can be malignant. Benign are usually uh, renal cysts and malignant tumors are um, or can be renal cell carcinoma, transitional cell carcinoma, or they can be metastatic tumors. Um, the treatment of the malignant renal tumor is going to be dependent upon the size of the tumor and also the location. So if that's something that you find on CAT scan or imaging, then a referral is going to be warranted to a urologist. That way they can decide, you know, do we need to do a partial nephrectomy, a total nephrectomy? Um, do we need to maybe consider cryoablation, so freezing the tumor um, if it's small enough? Or do we just do active surveillance where we just watch the patient if they're, you know, of an elderly age and it's not, it wouldn't be a reasonable um, treatment to have that patient undergo a, an invasive total nephrectomy procedure. So um, a referral to a urologist for surgical evaluation if you find any type of malignant tumor is uh, warranted. Benign renal cysts, we do get referrals for that commonly, but um, if it's a simple cyst, then that is something that can be monitored with a ultrasound yearly to make sure that it's not progressing or growing too rapidly. If it's a complex renal cyst, then that might be something that you do want to go ahead and refer to a urologist for. Bladder tumors can be transitional, papillary, or non-papillary. These patients are coming in with painless gross hematuria. Oftentimes they have a positive smoking history in the past. Um, smoking is the number one cause for bladder cancer, so obtaining a social history is important as well. Um, sometimes if it's progressed a while, the patient might have some dysuria and frequency, some weight loss as well. Their urinalysis is going to have some trace blood on it um, if they aren't already having gross hematuria. And diagnosis um, to confirm a bladder mass is with a CT scan of the uh, abdomen and pelvis and then also a cystoscopy by a urologist. Management for bladder tumors um, may consist of several different treatment options. If patients are found to have a non-invasive superficial tumor, that can be removed endoscopically. Um, and what we would do is do a, a, a procedure called a cystoscopy and go in and resect that tumor superficially. superficially. It's called a transurethral resection of the bladder tumor. If the patient is found to have muscle invasive bladder tumor, then a radical cystectomy and or chemotherapy um, is usually what we're, a serious discussion that we're having with the patient in the office. If the patient has metastatic tumors, radiation and chemo um, are being considered as well. And we do work closely with oncology in those cases. Um, Follow-up for superficial bladder tumors is a urinalysis um, to make sure there's no microhematuria or gross hematuria as well, and a cystoscopy routinely every three to six months. Um, patient education includes ongoing follow-up and care, making sure that they're not having issues with urination, making sure that they don't have ongoing gross hematuria, giving them reassurance, letting them know that, you know, they do need to follow up routinely with their urologist and making sure they're compliant with that. 
Also, if they did have a radical cystectomy, making sure that they know how to care for their urostomy and then making sure that you're doing good education and follow up on smoking cessation. BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia or hypertrophy is when there's proliferation of the cellular ele elements of the prostate resulting in enlargement and potentially chronic bladder outlet obstruction. These patients are presenting with obstructive urinary complaints. So they're saying that they have, they're going often to the bathroom, they're going urgently to the bathroom, they're peeing multiple times at night, they're having some hesitancy in getting their stream started. They're not emptying their bladder completely. They're straining to pee. Their stream is weak, and sometimes they have some post void a dribbling as well. When patients with BPH symptoms come into the office, it's important for you to get a thorough history. So understanding the onset, how long um, they've been experiencing these symptoms, how severe are their uh, obstructive lower urinary tract infection symptoms, um, do they have any comorbidities such as diabetes? Is there any sexual dysfunction um, associated or any neurological impairment? And do they have a family history of BPH or, or prostate cancer? Um, a physical exam is going to include a digital rectal exam. So you want to make sure that um, you're assessing the prostate for the size, making sure there's no nodules present making sure that it's um, symmetrical and that the consistency is, is normal. And then it might be a good idea if your office has these um, symptom scores available, but the American Urologic Association Symptom Index, or the AUS um, S is what it's called, um, in the international prostate symptom score, the IPSS, those are commonly used in my urology office. And what we do is we have the patients go through and um, score the severity of their urinary symptoms. And depending on the score, that's when we will talk to the patient about how severe their symptoms are, how bothersome their symptoms are, and determine whether or not we need to initiate medication or if they're on medication, then we need to be going the next step in scheduling them for a cystoscopy for further evaluation for a possible surgical procedure. Um, testing for BPH includes a urinalysis, making sure there's no infection, there's no blood on the dipstick, checking a PSA to make sure there's no um, false elevation, no prostate cancer, checking a post void residual, making sure that there's no significant urinary retention because of their prostate. And you might want to consider doing additional testing such as a pressure flow. Um, it's also called a Euroflow, and that just measures the, um, the force or stream, the force of their stream of urination. Um, an ultrasound, you can do that. That might check for hydronephrosis. Again, that's not something routinely that we order. Um, for BPH, but might be considered for someone who um, has persistently elevated post void residuals and, as I mentioned, a cystoscopy. So we can directly visualize what is the size and character of the prostate and is there any abnormalities of the bladder as an effect of the enlarged prostate. So working too hard because the prostate's too big. And if that's the case, then you'll see what's called trabeculations or indentations of the bladder from it being overworked from an enlarged prostate. Now let's move on to treatment options for BPH. Um, BPH can present as mild, moderate, and severe. So patients who come in with mild BPH symptoms, they might go to the bathroom once or twice a month at night, they might notice that they're starting to go a little bit more often during the day. Their stream is intermittently weak, maybe just in the daytime, in the morning hours when they wake up or right you know, before they go to bed or during the night. So then that's not too bothersome for them. So in, with patients who are experiencing mild BPH symptoms, we usually talk about lifestyle modification. So making sure that 
we're reducing caffeine, making sure that they're going to the bathroom often and eliminating um, as much as they possibly can, making sure that they're curtailing their fluids prior to bedtime. If someone comes back and they're like, my symptoms have worsened, I'm going more often during the night, my stream is weaker, I'm going more often to, during the day, then you might wanna consider medication, oral medications at that time. And there are two different types of oral medications that we prescribe for BPH. One are the alpha blockers. And there are several different type of alpha boxer, blockers. There's doxazosin, terazosin, those are commonly used in hypertension, so you're going to need to monitor their blood pressure. Sometimes people prescribe that because it kills two birds with one stone. So you get the antihypertensive component and you get the um, obstructive, uh, relieving the obstructive urinary symptom component. Um, then there are the alpha zosin, uh, the tamsulosin. Those have a lower risk of hypotension. You don't necessarily have to monitor your blood pressure. They tend to be a little bit more expensive, um, but not. I've not really had patients that have complained or had issues with it. They do have a side effect of dizziness, so we usually tell our patients to take those medications at night. And the the goal of these medications is to relax the prostate, so these patients can can pee easier. It's obviously not going to treat the underlying etiology of the BPH, which is a, an obstructed prostate, but it gives them symptom relief, which is helping their, their stream improve, helping them not go to the bathroom too often during the day, help them to um, be able to feel like they're emptying their bladder completely, helping them feel like they're not going to the bathroom too often during the night. Um, these medications um, can cause retrograde ejaculation as well. So that means that these patients are able to have an orgasm, but they're not able to ejaculate outwards. It is reversible, but it is a side effect of the medication. Another medication that you can use are the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, inhibitors, and that's the dutasterides and the finasterides. These medications are fairly cheap. Um, it can be used with or without the alpha blockers, but the goal of the five alpha inhibitors are to shrink the prostate. So they don't shrink the prostate immediately. It generally works over three to six months um, period of time before they notice an effect. But when they are used in combination with an alpha blocker, they do work a little bit better. I'm going to be honest, the five alpha inhibitors um, I will prescribe, but generally I'm starting out with the alpha blocker and then I'm adding the five alpha inhibitor if I need to. Um, and then it's also important to note that the PSA will decrease by 50% for the patients um, or for patients who take the uh, five alpha inhibitors. So this is just a side note that if a patient comes in and they have an elevated PSA level and we're suspecting that patient to have an elevated PSA level because of an enlarged prostate, not because of cancer, then we'll give them the finasteride um, to see if that decreases the patient, the PSA in half. If it does decrease the PSA in half and it stays that way, then we know that the elevated PSA is likely because of BPH. If the PSA is rising on finasteride, then you need to consider that there's probably some type of prostate cancer there. Salt palmetto is a herbal medication that um, some patients like to use because they don't want to use prescriptive medications. Um, I do have some patients who swear religiously by salt palmetto, but honestly, there's no evidence of its efficacy. Um, if a patient progresses to severe or advanced BPH, then the conversation of having a cystoscopy um, should take place, and that cystoscopy, again, evaluates the prostate and evaluates the bladder to see if the patient is a candidate for surgery. And usually the patients who progress to surgery is when the medications have failed and they're no longer working. Um, 
so that's a conversation that we have. The transurethral resection of the prostate or the TERP is the gold standard for um, BPH. Uh, green light laser photovaporization, that is another surgery um, or procedure that we can do where we're actually vaporizing the obstructing prostate um, and not resecting it as we would in a TERP. Both of those treatments do cause irritative voiding symptoms post-procedure. So patients um, complain of frequency, urgency, intermittent blood, and burning um, for about one to three months after the procedure before things start to get better. They notice immediately that their stream has improved immediately after procedure, but the other symptoms do stick around for about one to three months post-procedure, and it's normal for that to happen. Urolift is um, something that we've introduced into um, my office, and that is where we're using um, rods to actually hold back the um, prostate so we can do that particular procedure in the office. The patient doesn't have to go under general anesthesia, but if the urolift fails, then the patient um, will likely be a candidate for the green light laser or the TERP. So the urolift is less invasive, usually for patients who don't have, you know, horribly big prostates, um, and they, again, don't have to be under general anesthesia for it. Prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, is a protein produced by normal and malignant cells of the prostate. The PSA is variable, and many factors can contribute to its elevation or reduction, including prostatitis, BPH, having a digital rectal exam, recent ejaculation, recent instrumentation, such as a Foley catheter or a cystoscopy, and heavy exercise, such as bike riding. PSA may be used to monitor for prostate cancer and also for recurrence after treatment. The American Urological Association is the um, association who my office follows uh, their guidelines from, does not recommend routine screening. They recommend against screening in men less than 40 years of age. Um, because in this age group, there's a low prevalence of clinically detectable prostate cancer, and there's no evidence demonstrating the benefit of screening in this age group. The AUA also recommends screening in men 40 years to 54 years at average risk. For men who are 55 years um, of age at higher risk, there should be shared decision making between the patient and the provider. And higher risk means that the patient is an African American or has a family history of prostate cancer and a first degree relative. For men ages 55 years of age to 69, the AUA also agrees that there should be shared decision making as well. Um, and there should be a conversation about the risks and benefits of screening and treatment in this age group. And finally, the AUA does recommends not to screen, uh, does not recommend PSA screening in men 70 years and older or any man with less than a 10 to 15 year life expectancy. So it's really important that when you get in practice, you are, um, you know, what your office um, is supporting, what what association and guidelines they support so that you're making the right decision for your patients. The American Cancer Society recommends asymptomatic men who have at least a 10-year life expectancy should have an opportunity to make an informed decision with their health care provider about whether to be screened for prostate cancer or not. Men at average risk should receive this information starting at 50 years old, and men with a higher risk, the African Americans, the patients who have a family history of prostate cancer, should receive the information beginning at 45 years old. Asymptomatic men who have less than a 10-year life expectancy should not be offered a PSA screening. For men between the ages of 50, 55 to 69 years old, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends shared decision-making 
to undergo periodic PSA screening. Providers should not screen men who do not have a preference for screening. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends against screening in men 70 years or older. Scrotal swelling is a common urological complaint, and it's important to recognize whether the patient is experiencing pain or no pain. When a patient presents to the office with scrotal pain, testicular torsion should be ruled out immediately. Testicular torsion presents with acute onset, severe pain, nausea and vomiting, and usually occurs in an adult, a young adult male or an adolescent. One testicle is usually higher than the other, there's an absent chromastic reflex, and there's testicular swelling, discoloration, or induration. It is a medical emergency. Other causes that are non-urgent that commonly present as pain is epidorchitis, and this is a gradual onset of pain and swelling. Possibly urinary symptoms are associated with the pain and swelling. So with these patients, a UA, urine culture, um, a CBC, and STD testing are common tests to be performed, and usually it's treated with two to four weeks of oral antibiotics. An ultrasound is the best test for evaluating testicular trauma or pain. Some things that can contribute to painless scrotal swelling is a mass or a tumor, which can be palpated on the actual testicle and it's firm. You wanna make sure that if you find this on your exam in the office or in the hospital setting that you refer the patient for urology for evaluation of a malignancy. A hydrocele, which is a benign fluid collection in the scrotum, is common in infants, but it can also be seen in adulthood. It usually transilluminates on exam and it's usually no pain is associated with it. It can fluctuate in size, and usually the care is supportive unless the hydrocele becomes increased in size that it affects the quality of life for a patient. A hydrocelectomy by a urologist can be considered at that time. A varicocele is dilated veins around the spermatic cord. It occurs in about 15 to 20% of all men, and it's very rare before puberty. Men usually complain of a bag of worms feeling that's more pronounced when standing or with a Valsalva maneuver. Left varicoceles are also associated with infertility. Again, the care, the treatment for varicoceles are supportive care unless the patient becomes bothered by the symptoms, and in that case, a varicocelectomy can be performed. Epididymitis is a common urological complaint which consists of inflammation of the epididymis, usually caused by sexually transmitted infections in men who are sexually active less than 35 years of age or by other pathogens in men greater than 35 years of age. Signs and symptoms of epididymitis include dysuria, frequency, urgency, fever and chills, gradual onset of unilateral scrotal pain and swelling over several days, and sometimes urethral discharge. On exam, you'll feel and be able to palpate a tender and indurated epididymal tail. Symptoms may be acute or chronic. Patients presenting with concerns for epididymitis should have a urinalysis, and on the urinalysis, you might note that there's pyuria or bacteria in about 50% of patients. If a CBC is obtained, leukocytosis might be noted. For men that are less than 35, STI testing should be performed. And on the scrotal exam, as mentioned, you'll find a firm, tender, indurated epididymis. Management might include rest, scrotal support, ice, NSAIDs if the patient's able to take them, and antibiotics empirically. For sexually transmitted infections, ceftriaxone plus doxy is the gold standard. For non-sexually transmitted epididymal infections, doxy, bactrim, or fluoroquinolone is suggested. Now let's move on to penile concerns. Both of these disorders, paraphimosis and phimosis, occur in men who are uncircumcised. 
parathymosis occurs when the retracted foreskin is trapped proximally behind the coronal sulcus. There's a risk for ischemic injury, and the treatment is urgent urological evaluation with reduction attempt. Phimosis occurs when the foreskin cannot be retracted fully. It normally occurs in newborn males due to glandular adhesions, which break down as the child grows. If the adhesions persist, it can be treated with 0.1% beta-methasone cream four times a day and gentle manipulation of the foreskin for two to six weeks. If this is ineffective, then a circumcision um, may be the next best thing for the patient. Hypogonadism or low T is the decrease or absence of the hormone testosterone secretion from the testes. Subjective complaints of patients with hypogonadism are fatigue, low libido, ED, mood swings, and weight gain. Common workup for hypogonadism patients is obtaining a thorough history, including inquiring about recent life changes, lifestyle habits, medications, a physical exam with a focus on the GU, with an inspection of genitalia, penis, and scrotum, and labs including free and total testosterone level, complete blood count, lipid panel, and PSA. Patients who are found to have hypogonadism should be counseled on lifestyle changes, including diet, exercise, smoking cessation, and decreased alcohol consumption. If a patient decides to be treated with exogenous testosterone replacement therapy, you have to remember that testosterone replacement therapy is a controlled substance, so you need to have a DEA number in order to prescribe. There are three different treatments for testosterone replacement therapy. One includes transdermal, which is the androgel and testum. It comes in 1% or 1.62%, which the patient applies to the upper arms and the back of the shoulders. Patients cannot have contact with women or children with therapy of the, trans, of the transdermal testosterone replacement therapy. After they apply, they have to cover their um, areas with a t-shirt and wash their hands thoroughly. Testosterone injections with either testosterone siphonate or testosterone enthanate um, is dosed at 200 milligrams per ml intramuscularly every two weeks. Testosterone pellets are placed by a specialist, and this is where um, small pellets of testosterone are placed into the subdermal layer of the, um, of the buttocks uh, to increase levels of testosterone that are broken down over four to six months. Um, testosterone replacement is contraindicated in men with prostate cancer. And it's important to know that labs and follow-up should be checked every six months to ensure the patient's and the labs are stable there's, and there's no significant changes. You should consider adjusting the dose of the testosterone and or referral if labs become abnormal or if the patient is not responding to testosterone replacement. Exogenous testosterone therapy can cause prostate enlargement, elevated PSA, increased liver function tests, and polycythemia. Erectile dysfunction, or ED, is the in inability to maintain an erect penis with sufficient rigidity for sexual intercourse. It's estimated to affect 10 million males in the United States. Contributing factors to ED include vasculogenic causes such as hypertension, diabetes, or high cholesterol. There's either a poor inflow, meaning that there's arterial insufficiency or large vessel arthrosclerosis, or there's enhanced outflow from a venous leak in vasculogenic ED. Psychogenic ED means that psychological causes such as performance anxiety or depression contribute to ED. Neurologic factors include diabetes or spinal cord injuries, following priapism, which is a prolonged erection, or pyrones can contribute to ED. Pyrones disease means that there's palpable plaque that causes the penis to be curved abnormally. Medications such as alcoholism, smoking, psychotrophic medications can cause ED. Pelvic surgery, 
um, can contribute to ED. Um, what occurs is there's damage to the nerves or the pudendal ar arteries, um, specifically in surgeries such as the radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer, cystectomy, you're removing the bladder for bladder cancer, or abdominal perineal resection, APR. Uh, low testosterone is often associated with ED as well. Workup for ED um, includes inquiring about recent life changes, lifestyle habits, medications, GU surgeries, testosterone panel. You want to do a GU exam to inspect the genitalia, make sure there's no palpable plaques along the shaft that would be um, that would indicate pyrones. Make sure the scrotal exam is normal as well. First line medication um, for ED are the PD5 inhibitors. And these medications increase the blood flow to the penis to cause an erection by inhibiting the enzyme phosphodiesterase, which destroys the CGMP. And these medications include sildenafil, vardenafil, and tadalafil. Um, tadalafil can also be given at a low dose at five milligrams um, for BPH. So sometimes if patients are having issues with BPH, and ED, um, we'll give them a dose of, or we'll try them on to Dalafil 5 milligrams daily to try to kill two birds with one stone. Um, Avanafil, which is Stendra, is also a medication as well. I very rarely use that one because um, it tends to be more costly. Common side effects of the PD-5 inhibitors are headaches, flushing, GI upset, and these medications are contraindicated in patients who take nitrates or who have serious cardiovascular issues. They should be used in caution in men who take alpha blockers such as tamsulosin. Other management options for ED include the mechanical vacuum constriction device or the vacuum pump the intracarvenous injections or the penile injections that's used um, with a compound medication. Patients inject the compound medication into the shaft of the penis to create an erection. There's a high risk for priapism with the penile injections, which is a prolonged erection. If this is to happen, it is a medical emergency, so patients should be directed to go to the ER. There's the inflatable penile prosthesis pump, which is surgically implanted by a urologist, and also consider testosterone replacement if testosterone labs are low. I want to briefly touch on hernias for just a second as we conclude this lecture. And I know you guys already talked about this in previous lectures, so I just want to give you a quick summary. There's inguinal hernias, there's femoral hernias, there's ventral and umbilical. Inguinal hernias are most commonly seen. They um, can be repaired by a urologist. We do have a couple urologists in my practice, actually, that do inguinal hernia repairs. The other hernia types are generally um, directed to general surgery. Symptoms of hernias include bulge in the groin, which grows with standing, coughing, or straining, burning sensation in the groin, groin pain with movement, heaviness, or pain in the testicles. If the hernia is incarcerated, the patient might present with nausea, vomiting, fever, um, discoloration of the bulge, and constipation, inability to pass gas. Um, a physical exam might include palpable bulge in the groin, which may be tender or discolored. Incarcerated hernias are not reducible. Strangulated hernias are incarcerated and may be discolored. Um, treatment options for hernias include truss, manual reduction, surgical reduction. As far as hernia emergencies, strangulation and necrosis um, are a medical emergency. Um, because there's a reduced blood supply. So red flags would be severe pain, swelling, redness, constipation, bloating, and fever. This concludes our urology lecture. I know that I gave you a lot of information in a short period of time. Please reach out to any of us if you have any questions or concerns or need any clarification. Also, please do not forget to view the pediatric urology lecture next.
Have a great day.